It is November the 14th of 2017. This is uh, Macht und the program Macht und Menschenrechte on unser Politik blog. My name is Volker Reusing. Today I speak with David Banks. He is uh, head of communications um, at the Veterans for Britain, and we, are, uh, we will speak about the EU Army. Good evening, Mr. Banks. Uh, thank you for taking your time for us. Good evening. It's uh, my pleasure to speak to you. Mr. Banks, what is your position on an EU army? Well, our position is uh, slightly complicated if we take that question in its entirety for the following reason. We don't call it an EU army. Uh, we refer to it as EU Defence Union. But we are fully aware that Defence Union and all the other names that they give to this um, topic is a precursor to uh, a more concrete um, EU-led military structure. So uh, this is a stepping stone to an EU army, but at the moment what we're dealing with is military union or defence union. And our position on that is that we're against the UK, United Kingdom being a part of it, um, we are somewhat averse and um, not uh, particularly supportive of the European Union proceeding with it, simply because we see it as duplicating what already exists in NATO. There are several other issues and problems and uh, criticisms we have of it, including the way that it is being done in a rather undemocratic fashion. So, but I'm sure we'll get to those uh, points later on. Um, what do you think? Will the EU take advantage of the Brexit to create uh, the EU, EU army without um, uh, a British uh, possibility to vote no on it? Well, in reality, in truth, um, although they use Brexit as an excuse, this has been in the planning since 2014, so more than two years, um, in fact, more than three years. Um, their, their excuse for military union right now is uh, Brexit, uh, Donald Trump and Russia. Now, we've no doubt that the threat from Russia and the Russian uh, intervention in Ukraine is extremely unhelpful for European security and it's um, something that we all collectively in the West uh, should be uh, conscious of at least and uh, we, need, we need to show resolve in the West uh, against that kind of activity but we see the route for doing that as being through NATO. Um, but back to your original question, uh, does the, will the EU take advantage of Brexit? Um, well, they, they are doing so in, in the messaging, in the propaganda battle to justify the EU army. But in actual fact, um, yeah, this was being planned by Mr. Barnier, Mr. Juncker and Mrs. Mogherini um, since before the Brexit vote and actually since before um, the general election of 2015 in the UK which precipitated the Brexit vote. Um, is uh, the EU going to involve the British army um, to align it to, uh, to an EU army even though the Brexit? It's... Uh, it's apparent that the European Union is trying to encourage the UK to participate. And this isn't being done in the usual democratic ways, but they are encouraging UK civil servants to uh, give their consent to increasing and uh, broadening agreements uh, with relevance to the military and defence policy and defence funding and intelligence and space and a whole range of other things. That has preceded 
uh, for about a year, completely unchallenged. So British civil servants have said yes to about six separate EU Council agreements. And unfortunately, the ministers have just been obliged to follow what's gone on, uh, what's been done. Um, so yes, the EU wants the UK to be a part of it. And they have also encouraged Norway, which is not in the European Union, to be a part of their military union plans. And they have even adapted the planning of Defence Union and uh, the most recent agreement on PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation, so that it includes the possibility for third countries to come into their circle as what they call second countries. So the risk is very much still there for the UK and um, the, the people sat in their office blocks in, in Brussels, these unelected EU bureaucrats, have their plans and they very much want the UK and Norway to be a part of it. Um, you have uh, mentioned the duplication um, um, of um, of forces uh, between uh, um, NATO and uh, and EU, and yeah. um, well, I think it, it could. Um, undermine NATO, but um, there are also fears of uh, people in countries which are not NATO members uh, may, that these countries might be aligned to NATO, um, but uh, those countries only um, wanted to be members uh, of the EU, like Austria, Ireland, or uh, Finland. What do you think? Does it rather align non-NATO members, which are EU members, to NATO, or undermine, the, uh, does the EU uh, defense policy rather undermine NATO? I think um, it does undermine NATO in several respects. First of all, it... Um, undermines the decision-making of NATO uh, and the involvement of the US because it creates a separate structure. And the European Union has been uh, very keen to say this one line all about EU defense decision-making autonomy from NATO, which you'll find several times throughout all the recent agreements. And this we find worrying because It's, um, it creates a parallel structure and uh, it, it's um, it, and a dualistic structure. So whatever NATO decides, uh, and it might be so anything to do with exercises or uh, defense equipment and uh, research development or even policy on deployment, um, then is, has a sort of a counterpoint in an overlapping structure. Now, that can't possibly be useful. Um, <coughs> the other way in which it undermines NATO is the structures that the EU is creating. They, have the, uh, they already have the European Union Military Committee and the military staff. In NATO, there's the NATO Military Committee. In the EU, there is the um, uh, tactical airlift center. In, the, in NATO, there is the strategic airlift center. You can go all the way down the list with all of the structures that the EU has created fairly recently, and they have direct counterparts in NATO. So you have to wonder what they're thinking and why they think that's useful. When Mr. Juncker was asked about uh, NATO funding and whether he would encourage EU member states to spend the required amount on their militaries, he simply said, don't listen to Washington or the US president. Don't be bullied by the Americans. And that is very unhelpful because in the same breath as saying that, he's also encouraging EU countries to sign up to his plans. So it would suggest that the European Union wants the military to be done under its own terms, that the bureaucrats want control 
rather than um, a straightforward continuation of the NATO umbrella that has served us all so well. Okay, the duplication is a st uh, strong sign that the EU wants to put more, more gravity to the EU side and not only to complement NATO. Um, Could you say it again? Um, um, if I understand, uh, if you understand, is that the duplication of abilities, of a duplication of capabilities, mean uh, is a strong sign that the EU does not only want to complement NATO. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'd go along with that, yeah. Um, there is a sense that um, the EU wants to go beyond its current agreement with NATO because <clears throat> um, the EU and NATO signed this agreement where NATO would delegate a lot of responsibilities to the European Union. And um, some people in the UK at the time saw that as useful. But in actual fact... <clears throat> It simply reflects a kind of a growing ambition because they're not going to stop at those 42 areas that were delegated. They're going to keep expanding. And the fact that they've already got structures that duplicate shows that they want to um, uh, perform a continual expansion. And this is all part of the EU project. They need a military in order to justify the aspirations to statehood. And um, they even talk about new level of ambition. Uh, in, in the uh, military agreements that they've just made. So <clears throat> it's very, uh, very clear that um, defence and the efficiency and uh, efficacy of countries defending themselves isn't their motivation. It's, um, it's the centralisation of power under the uh, auspices of the EU. Um, what is now going to be done with, uh, in the scope of the structured um, cooperation of, of PESCO is uh, not yet an EU army. What do you think, when would uh, the limit be reached that it's not only structured cooperation, but uh, that it would be, um, when would the line uh, be crossed uh, to the st for the start of an EU army? Well, it's a very good question, and <clears throat> we can only provide a few indications um, from what's been said recently. Uh, certain dates have been mentioned by Mr. Juncker, where he talks about 2025 as the date where the Defence Union will be completed. That's only, what, seven, eight years away? And uh, <clears throat> they, they've that will mean that they have gone from nothing to full defence union in 10 years. Um, and again, an indication of their ambitions. Um, full defence union has to be regarded as common defence, and common defence being the crucial phrase in the treaties, which, uh, as you've rightly pointed out, requires a... Um, a referendum in member states that requires the full consent of all of the uh, EU Council. Um, so we think perhaps 2025 will be the point at which that will be reached. Uh, Mr Juncker has also spoken about making EU Council decisions on, in relation to PESCO and military issues, qualified majority voting, QMV. And therefore, that gives the EU and the EU Council far more potency in its use of its newly acquired military powers. And in a way, we have to consider that that in itself is a form of common defence. So, um, we're, we are, as observers, all of us, are a little unsighted. It's difficult for us to to see exactly the meaning of the treaty terms because they're changing the goalposts as time goes on. Um, PESCO, 
could equally be considered common defence because it means EU Council uh, um, authority over Europe's uh, armed forces, at least those that are in involved, which is 23 countries as we now know. Um, <coughs> I think uh, that, that, that probably um, answers your question. It's, it's a very vague picture, but um, the, the clear process that they are uh, continuing at present is that they want to reach common defence and they want to make sure that it is virtually impossible for any countries to say no to common defence by tying them in and tying them in circles and in loops and in chains and locking them in that um, extraction is impossible. This is one of the things that we're worried about in relation to the UK, but it's certainly a risk for all of the countries that uh, unfortunately still remain under the authority of the European Union. Um, common defence, the precursor to common defence is in play at present, it's happening, and they're going to make it as, as difficult as possible uh, for anyone who opposes the creation of common defence in 2025. And we can foresee, of course, that the EU will use all of its uh, strategic communications to persuade the populations of the EU to say yes to common defence when the requirement for referendums is triggered. And of course, all those countries will be subject to the same kind of misinformation and double talk that the EU has uh, perpetrated um, just in the last few years about defence and secrecy as well. Um, the uh, Constitutional Court of Germany has in its uh, Lisbon judgment of um, June the 30th of 2009 in uh, numbers 389 and 390 Uh, pointed out that um, Article 42, Paragraph 2, Subparagraph 1 of the Treaty on the European Union prescribes that a common def uh, before a common de defense, the uh, European Council has to make a resolution that they want to come defense, and then that uh, the member states have to confirm this uh, according to their constitutional requirements, meaning um, a yes vote by the national uh, parliament. But it's not explicitly de defined what is a common defense. Does it only mean EU army, but also um, the possibility um, to apply uh, the Uh, mutual defense clause in Article 42, Paragraph 7. It's not explicitly said. No, it's not explicit. And um, I would simply add that our understanding would be that the EU Commission wants direct authority o over defense and for defense to become uh, an EU um, competency. Um, so that there is no um, independent uh, member state role in defence. Um, I think that this is what we would interpret as, as the meaning of common defence. But as ever with the European Union, it's done in increments. Uh, we, we have always regarded common defence as a process where they they lead you up the garden path all the way to the front door and then they open the door and then they ask you whether you want to step in but it's the act of stepping in the in the door of the house that is common defense but they've all, already taken you all the way up um, through the garden path so um, that in itself is an act of trickery And uh, subordinate and um, and deception. And if they can make it appear that common defence virtually already exists, and you know we're 90% locked into uh, a joint military, therefore 
what does it matter if it's another 10% and it becomes 100%? Really, this will be the question when national parliaments and uh, the, 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 the referendums of member states actually take place. But you mean that they uh, will probably try to ask the national parliaments as late as possible? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll just keep changing the definition of common defense. They'll say, don't worry, this is only PESCO. Uh, we're only still cooperating. Without telling people that actually, when you coordinate policy, finance, um, equipment, intelligence, and everything else, then you in effect have common defense already. But common defense, I think, will mean the rebranding of all of the member states' militaries that are already linked up, and the rebranding, so the Italian army will now merge and into its neighboring armies and become simply the Italian division of the EU army. So that is common defense, really. Um, you hinted that uh, the EU army uh, is going to be a step in, for the creation of a state European Union. What makes you think that uh, they are going to make a state and not stop short before it to have all the power but to leave the responsibility with the state? What is, uh, makes you think that they really want a state? Um, <clears throat> it's, um, you never get these statements made directly, but you find all of the suggestions of statehood contained in the phrases of prominent politicians, uh, everyone from Mrs. Merkel to Mr. Macron to uh, Guy Verhofstadt and um, Juncker, Barnier and um, many other EU federalists. And when you put them together, uh, then you have a, quite a clear direction. So. Um, Mr. Verhofstadt, for instance, uh, often talks about uh, a United States of Europe and a, um, and a, a fully fledged, uh, centralized federal federal state. Um, Mrs. Merkel has spoken about the EU Commission becoming the executive uh, of uh, a federal entity and the parliament being um, a full sort of scrutiny chamber of that executive. Um, uh, and when we look at how the military planning feeds into that, we have to look at the statement by Mr. Ertinger, the uh, EU Commissioner for Finance, who, it, who said it might have been an accident, but He was very clear and honest where he said that uh, PESCO and the EU Defence Union decision-making and planning and agreements of the last 12 months is a step towards common defence. Uh, so uh, it's, it's all there in pieces. And oh, one other important thing to mention is that uh, Mrs Merkel, when she met Mr Holland and Mr. Renzi in the summer of last year. About a week or two after the Brexit vote, they met together on this Italian aircraft carrier to explain that they were going to forge ahead with an EU defense union. The reason for that was partly cosmetic. They wanted to make it look like the defense planning that had been coming for more than a year and a half, maybe two years, was uh, the product of member states. They wanted to make it look like uh, they were leading it. And they wanted to make it look like it was essential. And it was also a kind of a morale booster for the EU project. They just lost, technically lost to the UK, uh, but that didn't matter because Here's the new projects that they are going to be forging ahead with. Whilst they were having that meeting, they went to the memorial to um, Alberto Spinelli. I think it's Alberto, 
But Mr. Spinelli was the Italian EU Federalist who is considered one of the fathers of the European Union project. And they went to his memorial and they spoke about uh, the value of his contribution to um, European political theory and how, how much they valued it. Well, Mr. Spinelli, when he was alive, always spoke about the United States of Europe. He was the inventor of that phrase even before the Second World War. So, you know, the mood music that they um, they go through and and it, together with the wordings and actions will tell us in no uncertain terms that that that, that is the direction. It's uh, it's the United States of Europe. Um, it's, it's still difficult for us in the UK to persuade ordinary people that, uh, that that's what was happening. Uh, it's becoming less difficult because people have had a chance to speak more about the European Union. But for years and years, the European Union was just something that lurked in the background. It just existed. Um, and nobody really wanted to talk about it because it was a bit unfashionable and... Uh, everyone was happy to be British and <clears throat> the idea of EU statehood and nationality was just something um, unusual and not in their paradigm and thinking. Uh, but now here in the UK people are starting to realise, especially after what Mr Juncker has said over the summer about the direction of the EU, it's ever closer union, it's integration, it's um, centralization of decision making. People know now on balance that that is the direction. Okay, um, Mr. Um, Macron, uh, the extensive president of France, uh, has talked about um, um, that uh, the sovereignty shall be at the EU level, but he, uh, at the, on the other hand, still talks about a, gr a great power of France. He does not talk about France as a province of the EU, uh, but he talks about sovereignty for the EU. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and there's a clear contradiction. And I think what happens in EU politics these days and we saw it in the UK, Mr. Cameron was the same. Um, there is this sort of schizophrenia around Europe. National leaders know that if they talk about their own nation state in patriotic terms, there is a big audience for that and people are going to be happy to hear that kind of thing because um, their voters know that um, politics that is centered around the nation state gives them a voice and they know that they can in some small way influence those decisions and they can understand them but when decision making and politics is done on a, an EU wide level people feel that's just a bit too distant for them um, the peoples of Europe generally have a strong perception of um, national identity which is in combination with a sense of patriotism as well. So if, for example, um, when Mr. Renzi was in power last year and he was fighting for his political life, um, if you look at that, he didn't ever talk about Europe in those weeks where he was fighting for his life. He spoke about Italy, Forza Italia, um, waving the flag, uh, and it, it, on his on the stage behind him uh, during all these important speeches, it was all just Italian flags, not not one single EU flag. So he knew that that was the way to motivate his the patriotic sense in his voters and get them to vote for him. And so they'll do that when it's convenient to them. Uh, but, but really, uh, a lot of these people who talk in patriotic terms, like Mr. Macron um, and Mr. Cameron uh, last year, actually believe in a project that is uh, 
beyond their nation state and uh, which actually takes power from their nation state and, and therefore from their people. So it's, that's a contradiction and, and we uh, really feel that, um, I mean I feel, let's say personally as a Leave voter, a Brexit campaigner, that it's impossible for somebody to believe in the powers, the growing powers of the European Union and still be patriotic for my country because you're talking about the abolition of your nation state it's in favour of um, some other entity. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, I, I hope I've answered the question. <laughs> yes. Um, one very important uh, thing um, on the effects um, on, on peace, I think, uh, is um, that uh, the we have a prohibition of aggressive war for most countries only in Article 2, Paragraph 4, UN Charter, and uh, the EU law does not have an uh, own uh, prohibition of, of aggressive war, but it has uh, prescriptions uh, for military, uh, for combat missions, for values and interests in Article 42, Paragraph 5, TEU, and for crisis intervention in Article 43, uh, Paragraph 1, TEU. So it's very important what is pre, uh, uh, preeminent as the UN Charter, as the UN Charter claims in its Article 103, or uh, these prescriptions of the EU law. And if, there, if an EU army was created, would it uh, sh shift the weights uh, which is regarded preeminent? Yeah, could you repeat that last word? Uh, shift the way. Uh, would it uh, the weights? Uh, would it uh, make um, the EU position um, yeah. the, uh, regarding uh, that the EU law is uh, preeminent? Would it give more weight oh, to I this see. position, or in contrast yeah. to the UN Charter, which uh, UN Charter says it's the highest uh, international tre uh, treaty in international law? Yeah, it's a really important point, a really relevant point. Um, my instinct on that is that um, it's, it's, it's twofold. First of all, the Euro European Union has spoken a lot about working in cooperation with the European, with the United Nations, and the, the EU wants to be some kind of international police force for, for the United Nations as well. Uh, as you can tell from some of the wording of the military agreement. Uh, they want to be at the disposal of the EU and to be ready for any... Uh, sorry, at the disposal of the UN and to be ready for any United Nations mission. Um, it is an important point, but I, I, my hunch is that the EU would comply with the United Nations uh, principles and would acknowledge the UN as being a higher authority. Uh, however, one thing that does come in uh, as a result of all of the EU's um, planning and its military ambitions is that they will at some point seek to intervene in foreign affairs. Uh, it might be, for instance, uh, liberating innocent people in Syria and so they might create a cordon around uh, some towns in Syria using EU forces. <clears throat> now the, the other consideration is that they might start to use military force uh, on, on the borders of the EU um, and they might uh, consider aggressive action uh, they would certainly consider internal military action, and that might simply be mil military intelligence um, or a military arrest or uh, some kind of a localized um, uh, armed response to, to in an insurgency, for instance. And the new agreements that they've put in motion in the last 12 months – 
gives them the right to intervene internally in what they call threats to the union. <coughs> now, Eurosceptic groups, anti-EU groups in the UK, would surely represent a threat to the union. <coughs> so does this mean that uh, before or after the UK leaves the European Union, that Brussels will be monitoring and spying on the activities of Eurosceptic groups in the UK and their, um, their liaison with Eurosceptic groups in Germany, um, the Netherlands, Spain and everywhere else. There is every, every likelihood that they will. And in 10 years' time, I'm, I'm sure that we will have some examples of that happening. These people are very serious about the way that they're writing the next chapter of EU um, uh, history. They, um, they know that there's going to be dissent and they are closing the doors to that dissent uh, at this very moment. Now, back to your point about aggressive uh, um, intervention and aggressive military action. I think, you know, from our experience of the Iraq war as observers um, and, uh, let's say, Afghanistan and, and other conflicts around the world, a lot of those were justified as defensive measures. So I think that once the EU has the power to project force, um, it's very easy actually for any nation state wielding a big stick to justify aggressive action. And the United States and, and Britain did so on a false uh, premise uh, 14 years ago, which was uh, the, um, the supposed presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which was subsequently found not to have been there, but they managed to coax the United Nations Security Council into giving them a mandate to invade Iraq. We look back on it now, everyone in the West, and we realize that that was one almighty mistake, um, but the United Nations went along with it, and it was, it was deemed as a defensive act against an aggressive power, um, and it was used, therefore, to justify um, aggression by the West. <clears throat> um, therefore, there is every scope then for a, a militarized European Union to do the same. And when we're assessing the future of the EU after it militarizes, we have to consider that could be one of the things that it chooses to do. And so all of the countries of the, the free world and the West need to stay very close and uh, liaise with this, what will be a, a, a newly created superpower, and, and tutor it in a way um, on how to uh, restrain its use of force. Because at the moment, the way that those EU leaders in Brussels are talking, they sound absolutely determined to justify uh, their military power, and the one that way that you do that is by using it. And that I find a little bit uncomfortable uh, or discomforting. So um, these are all things that uh, would need to be considered by the international community and by European populations. It seems to me um, that if a, a state EU was created, then these prescriptions of the TEU would uh, be uh, kind together with uh, the TEU and the TFEU and all the protocols and declarations next to it would be a kind of, the, of an EU constitution if the EU becomes a state. And then these uh, prescriptions for combat missions would clearly be above the UN Charter. If they make a state. That, you, you could well be right. You could be right. Um, but uh, I wonder if, um, you know, once the, once the EU has the trappings of statehood, whether it would 
immediately default to sort of a submission to UN decision making. My, my guess is that it would, but I think you're right to pose the question because the question does need to be answered. You know, wh whose law is, uh, is supreme and predominant in, in these things? Um, I, it's, it's very easy for me to presume that it has to be the United Nations because it seems crazy to me that it would be anything else but the United Nations. But, you know, it's hard to preempt what goes through the minds of people sat in Brussels. They might take a different opinion. So it, that certainly does need to be clarified. I think you're right to ask the question. Um, with regard uh, to NATO, NATO uh, law, the North Atlantic Treaty uh, just uh, claims to be a, a normal international treaty. They don't claim supranationality. They, uh, yeah. The North Atlantic Treaty uh, even clearly subordinates itself below the UN Charter. So I think it's, uh, that's a v important difference regarding NATO. They, NATO does not claim to uh, be with its law above the UN Charter. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Yeah, that's a good good point. Um, and you know, if if only, it, it, wouldn't it be great if the European Union looked at NATO as as the benchmark? And if if they wanted to do something useful in defence, then create some kind of a subunit within NATO that cooperates with NATO that is. Um, that doesn't involve all these unnecessary power grabs in in finance and um, and production and legislation that uh, EU Defence Union currently does. So um, yeah, I, I would I would uh, I would agree. NATO is the um, is the template uh, for effective defence cooperation. Um, I remember when uh, NATO has made its strategic concept, which has um, introduced crisis intervention, which is not in the North Atlantic Treaty, there has been a court decision of the German Constitutional Court, and they have said, well, uh, that uh, our basic law and that the UN Charter is above the North Atlantic Treaty, and that's above crisis intervention. So. Uh, in the end, crisis intervention uh, does not is not above UN Charter. There's a crisis intervention prescription in the NATO secondary law. Yes, I see what you mean. So it's it's defensive rather than uh, offensive. Uh, yes, yeah. it means if yeah. they want to make crisis intervention in Syria, they have to ask the Syrian government, and uh, for example. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's interesting that in that context. Um, the uh, Germany's defence minister, Mrs. von der Leyen, was asked why the European Union wanted to pursue its new level of ambition and what it could achieve, which NATO couldn't already achieve. And she named three or four areas of potential intervention by, by the European Union, which it, it would have done if it had had the capability. And those were... Uh, the West Balkans, Ukraine, and Africa. And I think maybe one more. <coughs> I think maybe Syria. Um, so, you know, that gives us an indication of, um, of what you're saying. You know, what, what will the EU choose to do? <coughs> My, <coughs> you know, perhaps I'm being guided by hope rather than uh, practical analysis, but, but my hopeful expectation is that despite the illogical nature of the EU planning, I, I would hope that they still regard the United Nations as being the, the, the pinnacle of decision making and they, they abide by that. Um, um, would you like to add something about your vision of UK's defence and the role that NATO uh, should have in it? Yeah. <clears throat> the UK should retain its defence autonomy. Uh, what that really means for the UK is that we roll back from all of the six 
uh, agreements at EU Council that our ministers and officials have entered in the last 12 months. It also means that the UK should no longer be part of CSDP, Common Security and Defence Policy. Now, CSDP is a policy rather than an output. And it's important for me to say that because CSDP is too often spoken about way. It's described uh, incorrectly as merely being um, three uh, foreign intervention projects, uh, policing the waters off East Africa, intervening, intervening in Mali, and intervening um, somewhere else in East Africa, uh, and also in Kosovo. But it, CSDP is far more than that. It's, um, it's a policy that has uh, a really pervasive um, process, uh, progress into the national defence policies of member states. And this is orchestrated by the European Security and Defence College, which is a kind of a network of uh, defence analysts and academics and, um, and uh, defense, uh, senior defence staff all across Europe. Um, by coming out of common security and defence policy, the UK will be free to make its own decision making without undue influence from Brussels and, and the centre, from, from uh, the EU Commission and, and Council. So that's the first thing. <coughs> that, that will make us um, an independent, independent military power, which most people in Britain think we already are, but, uh, but we're not because of those uh, structures that I mentioned. There, but of course, there are other um, uh, levels and structures to the UK's um, presence as, as a military uh, as a military power. The UK will be cooperating very closely with all of its neighbours, and I want, and not just me, but veterans for Britain, and I'm I'm absolutely certain that the majority of British people want that cooperation to take place within NATO. And most of Europe, uh, uh, we uh, will continue, obviously, to regard as our closest friends. And uh, if not all of Europe, actually, but um, I'm talking about the Europe that uh, goes up to uh, the eastern flank of the European Union. Um, and then we have, uh, uh, within NATO, the United States and the UK must remain equally close to the United States and Canada. And we have an intelligence structure that the UK contributes to, which is called Five Eyes. And that includes the UK, the United States, Canada, and plus Australia and New Zealand. So those five countries cooperate in intelligence extremely closely and, and almost seamlessly. So whatever intelligence is gained by, the, by New Zealand instantly feeds into Five Eyes and the same for the UK, Canada and, and the rest. And Five Eyes is the biggest and, and probably the most uh, capable uh, intelligence network in the world. This is something that will help us uh, to help our European neighbours as well, uh, and as it already does. So, so that's Europe, NATO, Five Eyes. But on, in addition to that, the UK should build more bilateral relationships outside of Europe with um, some of its uh, friendly countries. It, they, it might be Brazil or India or um, uh, Japan, and uh, this will help the UK to build a, a friendly network uh, in defence, which, um, which provides an underpinning to foreign relations and uh, commercial relations. <laughs>
And <clears throat> and in that way, you know, the UK would be no different then to to any other country uh, that, that that does similar things. Um, it's important for the UK to to look globally, and I think that that is one way in which the UK can do that. Certainly, the Commonwealth connections between the UK and Canada and the UK and Australia and New Zealand need to be formalised. At present, those countries are very close in a sort of a psychological way with the UK, and there is an unspoken mutual defence. But I think that that perhaps should be formalised and uh, some um, uh, exchange, uh, some more active exchange um, uh, created. So I think that that generally describes the way that the UK will sit. Um, we're very much a part of Europe and we are obviously interested in uh, European defence and will continue to play a very active role, but independently, without any entangling uh, legislation and, um, and laws and uh, commitments that um, remove the decision-making capability of the UK government and individual ministers. I think that's important because that's the only way in which we can bring our full capability to the fore for for the benefit of, of our neighbours in Europe and for our friends around the world. Many thanks for the interview.